On August 6, 1940, Nikolai Vavilov was arrested and subsequently sentenced to death. His crime being a geneticist. For the Soviet Union in general, and Joseph Stalin in particular, 1940 was a busy year. One year after signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, the Nazis had invaded France and embarked upon the creation of a tripartite pact with Japan and Italy, what we now know as the Axis powers. Stalin had again sent Molotov to the negotiations to see whether the Soviet Union could become a permanent partner in this alliance. Stalin was busy. But not so busy, it seems, for him not to personally involve himself in the affairs of a Soviet agronomist, Trofim Lysenko, even going so far as to personally edit a speech that Lysenko would later give. Lysenko's thesis, echoing the pre-Mendelian inheritance theories of Lamarck, was that events in a person's life would themselves influence traits passed on to his children. The example commonly given is the expectation that the blacksmith's son would have well-developed biceps because of the exercise the father had done. This idea of behavior and environmental exposure resulting in attributes that are heritable and are passed on to descendants was very much in accord with Soviet political theory, particularly the idea of the new Soviet man as an archetype arising from post-scarcity communist society and with heightened traits that would be passed on to children for generations to come. Lysenkoism was central to what became known as Stalinist science, or Marxist genetics, an amalgam of scientific and political theory. As a young man, Lysenko received encouragement from the better-known Nikolai Vavilov, a geneticist and botanist, and proponent of what was known as Mendelian genetics, the idea that genes determined inheritance, that both parents contributed to heritable traits, and that some genes are dominant and some recessive. Mendelian genetics is the idea between the big B, little b, brown eyes versus blue eyes genes. This mechanistic and unmodifiable determinant of physical attributes was anathema to Stalinist political theory. Vavilov might have been ignored had he not gone out of his way to denounce Lysenko. Lysenko, for his part, denigrated Mendelian genetics as bourgeois science, and apparently this was sufficient cause for Nikolai Vavilov's arrest and subsequent death sentence. Objective science, that is to say the truth, had been suborned to political ambition. And here's the irony. Decades later, Lysenko's ideas of life experience of an individual resulting in traits that are passed on to progeny, the very idea that Stalinist science promoted over empirical evidence, that idea turns out to be at least partly true. I'm Josh Young, and this is Playing Odd a podcast about complexity and information in the natural world. Episode 2, Doing More with Less. In our last episode, we discovered the almost unfathomable complexity of the human brain, composed, as it is, of more than 100 billion synaptic connections. We were surprised by the finding of the Human Genome Project that the sum of human genetic material comprises only 20 to 25,000 genes. And we wondered how it is possible for this sparse genetic information to produce the precision and scale of the computational circuitry of the brain, the human connectome. We explored the idea of compression of genetic information and the presence of extra genetic regulatory DNA that affects the expression of genes allowing us to squeeze more information out of a limited resource. We introduced the idea of product-process dichotomy in the genetic code and emphasized that this would be a theme that will appear on multiple occasions through this podcast. But for all that, we still remained impossibly far from understanding how to get from 25,000 genes 
to a structure more than six orders of magnitude larger. And it is with this question that we begin today's episode. It is patently apparent that environmental exposure can affect gene expression. Every time we get a cold or are vaccinated, we are exposed to viral protein that elicits an immune response to the particular proteins of that virus or vaccine. What is this antibody production other than triggered gene expression? Of course, we do not expect our vaccinations to result in immunity that's passed on to our children, and indeed it is not. However, there are some exposures that seem to result in a chemical change to selected genes themselves. The most well-known of these is methylation. The methyl chemical group is very simple. Unattached to a larger molecule, CH4 is known as methane, or natural gas. Unlike DNA, there aren't any configuration options to the methyl group. The DNA molecules of your chromosomes differ from each other and those of other people, but every methyl group in your body is the same. The methyl group doesn't contain any information itself except about its presence and location. Instead, the methyl group serves as a flag. Both genes and histones, the structures around which DNA is wrapped, can be methylated, and these methyl groups cause certain genes to be more available for expression. That is to say, for protein synthesis. The methyl groups do not change the information content of the gene, nor do they add any information themselves. They simply make it more or less likely that a particular gene will be expressed. There are two good ways to think about methyl groups. They can be seen as switches on a railroad track that can determine whether a train will pass down the line or be shunted to a siding. In this respect, they are highly influential. However, the railroad switch does not alter the contents of the cars of the train. They are highly influential in expression, but they do not add any information to the gene itself. Another good way to think of methyl groups is as punctuation. The gene itself is a sentence composed of elements that together form the instructions for the assembly of a protein. The methyl groups may represent commas or semicolons or periods that terminate the expression of the gene. They are very important, but they do not add to the information content of the sentence. If they do not add much information other than their presence and location, why even discuss them in the context of neurodevelopment? It is because methylation may occur from exogenous influence. That is to say, a gene or histone may become methylated because of environmental exposure. Indeed, the developmental abnormalities associated with diethylstilbestrol, DES, seem to be associated with changes in methylation of DNA. Bisphenol A, or BPA, a chemical found in some plastic bottles, may also alter methylation and may even affect obesity. Even exercise has been associated with epigenetic changes. We generally think of genes of DNA as being the sole carrier of traits between parents and children. But if methylation, an epigenetic feature, can affect the development of a child, it too can be passed on from generation to generation. This turns out to be a trickier question than it initially appears, because there are two sorts of multi-generational traits, intergenerational and transgenerational transmission. The proof of the pudding seems to be in the third generation. I will explain. In the case of DES, it is the mother who is exposed to the chemical, and it is not impossible that the mother will also develop epigenetic changes, even if these do not manifest in any obvious way. The fetus she is carrying undoubtedly undergoes epigenetic changes in the manner described above. Therefore, the single exposure has affected two generations, the mother and the fetus. But what if the chemical also alters the cells in the fetus that will go on to become sperm or egg? This sort of effect, resulting from a single exposure, would then affect not only the mother and the fetus, 
but also the eventual children that the fetus might have. In this way, a single DES exposure would affect three generations. The mother, called generation zero, the fetus, called generation one, and the fetus's eventual children, called generation two. In order to establish that a trait has actually been inherited rather than a single multi-generational exposure, the trait must be present in the third generation, in generation three, that is to say, the great-grandchildren of the mother who was exposed. Incredibly, such demonstrations have been made, especially in plants in which methylation itself is replicated and passed on to progeny. The fidelity of replication of DNA is astounding. Copying errors occur, but they are impressively infrequent. The likelihood of base pairs being incorrectly copied in DNA replication is only about 1 in 10 million to 1 in 100 million. At least in plants, an enzyme exists to copy methylation marks so that they are replicated along with the DNA. These enzymes, methyltransferases, demonstrate a much lower degree of fidelity, with errors occurring once in every 25 methylations. Still, the effect of these epigenetic changes are, for the most part, carried across many generations. Although there is some suggestion of transgenerational epigenetic transmission in mammals, it is at least far less likely than in plants, and for a very interesting reason. Methylation serves a function in embryo development that is quite apart from environmental exposure. Methylation and other epigenetic changes are an important mechanism for cell differentiation. All of the cells of our body, with the exception of red blood cells, contain the same DNA, although sperm and egg cells contain only one copy rather than two. The question then arises, if brain cells and kidney cells have the same genetic content, why are they different from each other? Methylation, primarily of histones, varies by cell type so that even though the data for production of every protein is available in each cell, the relative expression of these data varies as a result of epigenetic changes. A kidney cell and a brain cell may have the same DNA, but they will not have the same methylation in the same places. On reflection, this is a bit of a problem because two particularly specialized cells are egg cells and sperm cells. These cells have also differentiated from the original cell line of the embryo from which they're formed. But upon fertilization, they must become undifferentiated so that they can serve as the new seed from which all else will grow. Cells that are capable of differentiating, that is to say, cells that themselves are undifferentiated, are referred to as stem cells because they are the stem from which other cells will form. Stem cells can be pluripotential, meaning that they're capable of turning into, of differentiating into, many different sorts of cells. Or totipotential, which means that they are so undifferentiated that they're capable of transformation into any sort of cell. For obvious reasons, the fertilized egg must become totipotential because it is from this fertilized egg that an entire organism must arrive. Since epigenetic changes like methylation are markers of differentiation, these must be erased in order to reset the fertilized egg into a totipotential cell that can differentiate and divide into every cell from which the organism is composed. The erasure of methylation marks of epigenetic changes make it impossible to pass methylation to the next generation. Well, not quite impossible, it seems. The erasure is often incomplete, and there's evidence that some of these epigenetic marks do in fact pass through transgenerationally. Methylation marks that fail to be erased are often termed escapees. The study of methylation escapees in mammals is complicated and largely ambiguous, with few concrete examples. One example in mice is evidence for transmission of obesity. In order to make transgenerational detection a bit easier, patrilineal, that is to say, transmission through the male line, is studied. 
the zero generation, that is, the original father mouse, may have environmentally induced methylation changes. The sperm of that mouse, necessarily contained within the same body as the father, may also undergo methylation changes, but the intergenerational transmission ends here. The grandchildren of the original father mouse, if they demonstrate the methylation-related trait, represent evidence of true transgenerational transmission. There is evidence that dietary restriction or other dietary changes may result in methylation changes that are passed on for several generations. This seems to be the exception rather than the rule in mammals, and evidence is even weaker for transgenerational epigenetic transmission in humans. Although dietary changes, exercise, and even of emotional trauma have been suggested as associated with methylation, studying the effects in later generations is difficult because other aspects completely independent of genes are also passed on generationally. Factors like poverty, education, access to resources are also intergenerational and affect the development of children. As the biologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote in his book The Panda's Thumb, human cultural evolution in strong opposition to our biological history is Lamarckian in character. What we learn in one generation, we transmit directly by teaching and writing. Although fascinating, we have to ask what the relevance is in addressing our initial question of identification of sources of information for neurodevelopment. That is to say, if the genome itself is inadequate to produce such a complex structure as the brain, can the information arise from elsewhere? Even though methyl groups do not carry much information, the information that they do carry may arise from the external world. This small amount of information does not come from the organism itself. To the extent that it has any influence on neurodevelopment, the information, the data, arise from the outside world. Although the amount of information conferred from the outside world, outside of the organism, is indeed very small, we will see the theme of what I call exogenous information recur at a significantly larger scale much later in this podcast. Let's ask a more fundamental question. Can the expression of a gene, even if it occurs multiple times, produce a structure that is more complicated than a single expression of that gene? In fact, let's state the query more basically. Can a set of instructions, if repeated, produce a structure more complicated simply through its repetition? We will answer this question in the next episode. In this episode, we asked whether factors outside of our genes can influence development and whether this influence is heritable. We discovered that environmental influences in the parent organism are passed to many generations of progeny and plants, and that some evidence suggests that limited transmission may occur in mammals as well. Looking more broadly at the flow of information that directs the development of an organism, we saw that environmental factors represent exogenous information and saw that instructions for building an organism are only partly contained within the organism itself. I want to thank you, kind listener, for taking this journey through complexity with me. A bibliography for this episode, along with links to additional material, can be found at playingodds.com. I hope this program will serve as an opening to a broader conversation. Please write to me with your questions or comments at josh at playingodd.com. I look forward to spending time with you next week. I'm Josh Young.